Okay, so now Dr. Jeff has been working with uh, the standardized patients at the simulation center and thinking of ways that you might uh, develop critiquing it as a form of assessment using the deteriorating patient through video-based technologies. And uh, so he, um, he's developed a set of videos that you might be able to see from at one point. And what they do is they look at the video and uh, students decide whether they manage the emergency appropriately using specific criteria of the emergency algorithm looking for airway, breathing, circulation, etc. in the video. Did the doctor or the medical student address all of those criteria? What did they miss and what did they do well? And the next steps that he's looking at is sort of doing an online moment by moment um, simulation that uh, with Emmanuel Blanchard, who's a computer scientist, that does sort of a high stress situation where the patient is literally dying if you don't put the right um, diagnostic test in immediately. And so th that one has not been tested yet, but that's his next step, right? Okay. And the, the last thing that we've been looking at is team building at the Surgical Simulation Center uh, in terms of how medical teams work together uh, to develop team effectiveness from the beginning of a practice environment, say a two-week session on simulated, um, simulation training for surgical uh, trauma units. And uh, the simulation centers look something like this. This is actually a medical trauma teams that are working together for the first time preparing to uh, deploy. And um, we've looked at how through the discourse, the video analysis, etc. this is one of my students, uh, Ilian Cruz, who has been looking at how teams evolve over, over a two-week um, practice opportunities using simulations, how the discourse reveals whether they actually are um, all sharing in the situation and learning together um, their roles. And the roles are very complex because some of them have to be the leaders, some of them have to be... Uh, administering IVs, um, checking airways, etc. And what she's been able to look at is sort of mental model building. Um, this last diagram is quite complex, but what's interesting is that the more effective teams on the left, you see this little circle that has the three individuals in the team um, scoring a four out of five on team effectiveness. And they've been analyzed as everyone sort of recognizing their roles. And so role playing is important, but it's more important to actually know your role and to be able to work together as a team in a way that you can support each other. The leader has to actually be a leader and not let the team override the leader, uh, which is what's shown in, um, in the situation here where the leader is separate from the other groups, the leader is separate from the other groups, and the less effective teams. Um, I guess what I wanted to show is that discourse analysis of qualitative uh, team experiences can actually reveal sort of where the groups are operating in a specific context and what each individual is doing in that context, how it leads to overall performance and management of um, patients. <clears throat> okay, so just a few concluding remarks. I've tried to provide a report on how computers might care and what the notion of caring is from my perspective and its relationship to uh, the use of technology in both informal settings and formal settings. And I've looked at um, providing you with some definitions of modeling uh, from an AI perspective, from a learning theory perspective, and I've provided some examples of how we've used these in our medical models of expertise, uh, expertise with teams and um, uh, how we're looking at the intersection between brain and heart. I've given some examples of assessment possibilities, and I guess I want to end with a, just one more video and one more slide. And this video is really from thinking about computers sort of a, out there. Uh, Patty Mays and Pranav Mystery from MIT are talking about computers developing a sixth sense or intuition about people. And I just want you to see what you think about uh, this last video. Uh, there we go. I'm, I'm wearing a camera, this is a simple webcam, a portable battery powered projection system uh, with a little mirror 
these components communicate to my cell phone in my pocket, which acts as the uh, communication and computation device. And yes, you also interact using natural gestures, both hands, etc. Because you can walk up to any surface, including your hand, if nothing else is available, <laughs> and interact with this projected data. The device is completely portable. Um, the reason why we're really excited about this device is that it um, really can act as one of these sixth sense devices that gives you relevant information about uh, whatever is in front of you. So we see Pranav here going into the supermarket and he's uh, shopping for some paper towels. And as he picks up a product, the system can recognize the product that he's picking up using either image recognition or marker technology and give him the green light or an orange light. Um, he can ask for additional information. So this particular um, choice here is a particularly good choice given his personal criteria. If he picks up a book in the bookstore, he can get the Amazon rating that's projected right on the cover of the book. And so Pranav turns the page of the book and can then see additional information about the book. Reader comments, uh, maybe sort of information by his favorite critic, etc. If he turns to a particular page, he finds an annotation by maybe an expert or a friend of ours that gives him a little bit of additional information about whatever is on that particular page. Reading the newspaper, it never has to be outdated. <laughs> you can get video annotations of the events that you're reading about. You can get the latest sports scores, etc. This is a more controversial one. <laughs> As you interact with someone at TED, maybe, um, you can see a word cloud of the tags, the words that are associated with that person in their blog and personal web pages. In this case, the student is interested in cameras, etc. And you need to know what the current time is. It's as simple as drawing a watch <laughs> on your arm. All right, so that gives you something. I guess I wanted you to think about that. Uh, is this an example of computers that are caring, responsive, and uh, receptive? I think there's something a little bit controversial about that um, video in the sense that, you know, how far are we going to go with personal privacy issues and ethics? I mean, it would have been nice for me to come here and see that you're a lucky Chan as soon as I saw you and what you do, but um, there's a bit of um, ethical considerations I think we need to be thinking about how far computers are going to invading our privacy. Um, and uh, that sort of goes into the last slide about computer tools that help us think and care. Can people who are uncaring become uncaring? That's one question. Can technology actually help people become more caring? And can computers care for humans? Um, can we or should we learn to read people's emotions? Um, there are obviously individual differences in demonstrations of emotions. You can, different types of poker faces, they're both demonstrating emotion, but you may not realize that. Um, I think we're just beginning to look at a very complicated frontier of linking affect and cognition. There's going to be years and years of exploration of this research, and looking at uh, these models in the context of technology is going to be an exciting field. Um, but we have to make sure that the models that we're using are not misguided and that we have to be cautious in the way we interpret the data and consider the ethics of caring as well as its detection. And I just want to thank you and my team from home uh, for this research. So thank you very much and I welcome your questions.